Lucky Bastard. The Lucky O'Toole Vegas Adventure Series, Book Four, by Deborah Kuntz. Narrated for you by Patricia Santomaso. Chapter One. Wow, talk about killer heels. The words were out of my mouth before I could stop them. I dropped my head for a moment, then recovered. I can't believe I said that. Open-mouthed, I stared at the body of a young woman sprawled across the hood of a candy apple red Ferrari on display in our dealership. The heel of one of this holiday season's signature Jimmy Choo's embedded in her neck. I can, growled Paxton Dane, the man who had summoned me to the scene, and the only other living, breathing human within shouting distance at this ungodly hour of the morning. His tone held a not-so-gentle chiding. Truth be told, he was right. Very bad form. Normally I had a better filter, but tonight it was on the fritz. At least I had an excuse. Murder always made me twitchy. Death by Jimmy Choo, I babbled, riding a building wave of panic. Well, at least she went out with style. The words and thoughts gathered like dark clouds heralding an impending storm. This is clearly a new twist on the stiletto as a murder weapon theme, don't you think? And can't you just hear Sherlock Holmes now? Come, Watson, murder's afoot. I choked back a nervous giggle, but was singularly unable to rein in my runaway foot and mouth disease. What had the poor woman done to deserve such a hasty exit? Better yet, who could have done such a thing? It's come, Watson, the game's afoot, growled Dane and you need to put a sock in it. Again, he was right, but I wasn't about to tell him so. I wondered who the dead woman was, and how had the Vegas magic so deserted her? At Dane's scowl, I swallowed the comment on the tip of my tongue. The sock reference was unintentional. He raised a finger, silencing me. He knew me far too well for my comfort level. When he was sure he had my attention, he continued... And if you still can't stifle yourself, I struggled to get a grip. Focusing on breathing, I gulped steady, even, deep lungfuls of air. Finally, the morbid comedian in me beat feet. Okay, maybe not. Clamping my lips together, I tried to think. Any way I looked at this situation, it was so not good. 3 a.m., a closed and presumably locked Ferrari dealership in my hotel, no less. A dead woman, a ruined shoe, and somehow, all of it had landed in my lap. Not entirely unusual, but certainly unappreciated. My name is Lucky O'Toole, and I am the Vice President of Customer Relations for the Babylon, Las Vegas's most over-the-top strip casino resort. Drowning in the aftermath of a still deep and turbulent romantic tsunami, I had recently taken temporary residence in smaller quarters in the hotel, a decision I was currently rethinking. Accessibility clearly had its downside. Dane was a former co-worker, sometimes suitor, and now awkward friend. Despite past skirmishes and unrequited affections, his, not mine for once, we'd reached a grudging respect for each other. A detente, if you will. He had said little since calling me. Instead, standing quietly off to the side, he lurked like a gargoyle, waiting, observing, while I absorbed the scene. Shadows angled across his features, hiding his expression behind a mask of darkness and reflected light. Arms crossed tightly across his chest, he hugged himself. Was he seeking comfort or stilling himself from action? Fight or flight, I was so there myself. Unfortunately, for me, flight was not an option. Like it or not, I was the Babylon's professional problem solver in residence, and the dead girl was clearly a problem. Sometimes being a grown-up sucked. Murder sort of refocuses you, doesn't it? The normal comfort I found in the familiarity of my own voice proved elusive. Dane had enough insight to know I didn't expect an answer. Frozen for the moment, I watched as the car rotated on a raised platform in the center of the showroom. 
each detail captured in the accusatory beam of a single spotlight mounted above. The young woman wore a silver spandex dress, very short, strapless, hugging her every curve. Her feet were bare. A red welt marred the otherwise perfect skin of her neck. As she rotated past, I had an unobstructed view of her dress. No underwear. Of course, this being Vegas, most of the young women went commando. No muss, no fuss, no panty lines, no worry as to how to get them off or where you might have left them when the evening was over. Vegas survival skills they should print in the visitor's guide, if you ask me. Chasing runaway skivvies was part of my job description. The wrong pair in the wrong place could be a catastrophe of epic proportions. Trust me on that one. Her eyes were open, sightless. They were blue, one a brilliant sky blue, the other a muddier ocean after a storm blue. Maybe it was the light, but I found the difference unsettling. One arm flung over her head, her legs splayed, her shoulder-length hair a spun sugar pillow under her head. She'd been beautiful, stunning even. The champagne-colored crystals of the single shoe fractured the light like a disco ball in a cheesy nightclub. A beaded mini hobo, multicolored sequins stitched on silver satin, dangled from a chain wrapped around her lifeless hand. I'd bet my life membership in the Conspicuous Consumers Club it was also Jimmy Choo. Somebody had a fat wallet and impeccable taste. Blood trickled from her wound, tracing a graceful path across the woman's bluish skin, then dropping silently to the hood of the car. The reds blended until it was difficult to follow the blood's meander down the smooth metal to the white faux marble tile underneath, where it pooled, a dark, ominous stain. Following imperfections in the stone, tiny rivulets of darkening color flowed outward until they painted a freeform web. But something important was missing. The other shoe. I bent down to peer under the car, clean as a whistle. Boy... Being Cinderella in Vegas clearly wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Who is she? I asked Dane, hoping he had some easy answers. With his hands jammed in his pockets, he shrugged, but didn't look at me. You are going to tell me how you managed to stumble upon this young woman, in this position, after hours, in a dealership locked up for the night, in a hotel where you no longer work, right? I pressed casting a quick glance at him as he stepped into the light and parked himself at my shoulder. He didn't look good. Well, that wasn't entirely true. Several inches taller than my six feet, with axe handle wide shoulders, a narrow waist that hinted at washboard abs, wavy brown hair, and emerald eyes, he always looked good, especially in his creased 501s and starched button-down. Normally, one glance at the man could throw an unwary female into hormonal overdrive. Tonight, however, with dark circles under worried eyes, his brows furrowed, his face pinched with an emotion I couldn't quite read, Dane didn't look his best. I didn't blame him. Even after years of dealing with the occasional dead person in my hotel, I still hadn't gotten used to it. Of course, most of them hadn't been murdered. Before Dane answered, he ran a shaky hand through his hair and avoided looking at me. From past experience, I'd learned a thing or two about Paxton Dane. Most of it the hard way. If he was good at anything, the long, tall drink of Texas charm was good at prevarication. Right now, I'd wager my future firstborn that Dane was framing his answer. Like a woman looking for the perfect pair of jeans, he'd try a few on for size until he got the fit just right. Only then would he trot out his choice for my perusal. With Dane, most of the time, what he told you wasn't nearly as interesting as the stuff he left out. I was in the poker room, watching. His eyes furtively sought mine, then skittered away. He nodded toward the dead woman. She caught my eye. Understandable. I took a deep breath marshalling my notoriously thin patience. She was playing, I prompted. Dane grunted. I took that to mean yes. 
She'd made it to the final table of the thousand-dollar buy-in, but she busted out about an hour ago and left. Alone? As far as I could tell. This time I gave Dane my full attention, leveling my eyes to his. He still wouldn't look at me for more than a few seconds. What do you mean, as far as you could tell? You're a private investigator. Don't you guys notice that type of stuff? I wasn't investigating. I was watching. Ah, so your powers of observation only function when you're on the meter? I knew he was smart enough to recognize a rhetorical question, even when it was obscured in dripping sarcasm, so I forged ahead. If you weren't investigating, how did you manage to find her here? This time, his eyes met mine. I was on my way to the garage. My truck is parked on level three, row C. You can check it out if you don't believe me. The tilt of his chin held a challenge, but his eyes looked haunted. I saw the door to the showroom was cracked open. I knew the place was closed, so... You investigated. I finished his sentence, enjoying the minor victory. Why didn't you call security? After all, you used to work for them. You know the protocol. Or better yet, why didn't you call the police? I called you. Am I lucky or what? I blew at a strand of hair that tickled my eyes. Even at 3 a.m. and far from my best, I had enough functioning gray matter to realize he hadn't answered my question. Of course, I knew my in-your-face style always shut him down. It must be a Texas thing, those southern men and their delicate egos. Unfortunately, coddling was rarely in my repertoire. You weren't stupid enough to touch anything. A tick worked in his cheek as he ran a hand over his eyes. I checked for a pulse. That's all. Uh-huh. I suppose that's your bloody footprint, then. I pointed to a half print under the driver's side door, triangular with a pointed toe. His head swiveled in surprise, his eyes following my finger. We both glanced at his feet. Very expensive kickers, made from some exotic skin. Looks like it, he acknowledged with a deepening frown. Not messing with a crime scene. Isn't that the first thing they teach you in investigator school, right after they give you your very own decoder ring? I asked, but Dane didn't take the bait. None of this was adding up, and Dane didn't seem inclined to offer any clarity. And to think, thumbscrews weren't included in my vice president's superhero utility belt, an oversight I'd have to remedy. But until then, I'd have to wait for answers. Not one of my best things. Especially since I had no doubt that, while what Dane had done would make interesting reading, why he had done it would keep me riveted. But I'd leave Dane's questioning to the police. Surely they had a set of thumbscrews somewhere. Or, better yet, a waterboard. Well, I said, my word choice matching my brain function. It seems a bit late to muster the in-house cavalry, but don't you think it would be wise to call young Romeo? Detective Romeo was the ace up my sleeve at the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, metro to the locals. Romeo was definitely a high person in a low place. The still wet behind the ears detective and I had met chasing a weasel. We bonded over an odds maker who had become a tidbit for a tiger shark and cemented our working relationship while investigating a disappearing magician. He'd do his job, but he'd watch my back as well. Loyalty, a precious commodity in a fickle world. Having one of Metro's finest on speed dial spoke volumes about my life, but I refused to think about it. Instead, I flipped open my phone and pressed his number. The kid was going to have a field day with our Ferrari girl. Dane and I had boosted our butts onto the dealership's parts and service counter and now sat hands tucked under our thighs, feet swinging. My thoughts whirled as I concentrated on my alternating white ankles and studiously avoided looking at anything else. My feet, which protruded from the ends of my purple flannel pajama pants, were tucked warmly into fuzzy slippers. A departure from my normal vice president costume, but at this godforsaken time of morning, it was all I could muster. 
I was particularly proud of the faded UNLV t-shirt that rounded out my ensemble. A Vegas fashionista to the end. The whir of the motor turning the Ferrari's dais and the imagined drip of blood mingled with the distant echoes of fun and frivolity leaking in from the casino beyond the closed doors, thankfully keeping silence at bay. Quiet would have been way too creepy. Unable to resist the draw of the macabre, I cast a furtive glance at the girl's body, as if half expecting her to push herself to a seated position, remove the shoe from her neck, and laugh at a really great practical joke. But she didn't. Do you normally sleep in flannel pajamas? Dane's voice sliced like a knife through my carefully constructed calm. I flinched, then shot him a sideways glare. Why would you care? I snapped. We resolved that issue, as I recall. Not entirely to my satisfaction. He gave me one of his famous grins, although it lacked its normal wattage. Still, it seemed out of character, not to mention out of place and inappropriate. Too antsy to sit any longer, I hopped down from my perch and turned to face him. I'll have you know there are numerous factors that influence what I sleep in. Hands on my hips, I paused and looked at him. A smirk lifted one corner of his mouth. Smirking was not on my list of acceptable responses. Why are we talking about this? It seems irreverent or something. Not to mention that it's none of your business what I sleep in or who I sleep with. Now where had that come from? You don't have to rub it in. Dane eased himself to his feet. But somehow, talking about something normal. I knew what he meant. Comfort in the mundane. Not that my sex life was mundane. It was non-existent. But that was another story. And not that Dane and I normally talked about it. But there had been a time, fairly recently in fact, when he'd been in the running. Standing in front of me, with a finger under my chin, he lifted my gaze to his. His eyes were dark, troubled, his expression serious, and he was way too close for comfort. While I was wise to his charms, I wasn't immune. I wanted to step back, but his hand on my arm held me. Lucky, he said, his voice shaking. I'm going to need your help. For a moment, time stopped. The empty room crowded around us. I stared at my friend, and for the first time, truly saw. Red scratches on the side of his face, one deep enough to draw blood that had dried to a dark crust. A tortured look in his eyes, the stern slash of his mouth, the slight tremor to his hand as he quickly stuffed it into the front pocket of his jeans. The touch of his skin on mine was unexpectedly cool. Oh, God, what had he done? We both jumped as my former lover Teddy's voice shattered the silence, singing Lucky for Me. My phone, dang. And why had I chosen that song as my ringtone? It skewered my heart every time I heard it. The jumpstart surge of adrenaline pegged my heart rate. My hand closed over the offending device, jerking it from my pocket. I shot Dane what I thought might resemble a rueful look. Self-flagellation. I flipped the thing open. What? Lucky? The delicious French intonation, the voice as smooth and rich as a homemade hollandaise, could only belong to one person, Jean Charles, our new chef and, if he had his way, the new man in my life. But once burned, twice shy, I was riding the brakes. I am thinking you are not sleeping, he continued. I did not awaken you then, yes? No. For some reason, or perhaps for a multitude of reasons, I seemed to be struck monosyllabic at the moment. His voice suffused me to the core with warmth. Taking a deep breath, I struggled to apply pressure to those breaks. But they'd all gone mushy, along with my brain and other body parts that I won't mention. Apparently, my self-control had thrown in the towel as well. Toss a handsome man with empty promises in my path, and I'd take the bait, hook, line, and sinker. Swallowing it whole, 
I'd lose my heart only to have it handed back to me on a platter. I knew the drill. Why couldn't I just grab some local hunk and have wild, meaningless sex, like everybody else? Unfortunately, I apparently lacked the moral fortitude to be immoral. No? You were sleeping then? No. I mean, yes, you did not awaken me. Exactly when did I lose the ability to speak proper English? I'm sorry. I'm a bit muddled at the moment. I scrunched my eyes shut and tried to block out the scene around me. Dane's stricken face. The dead woman on the car. Turning my back to them, I conjured a mental picture of the Frenchman in a vain attempt to recapture a sense of normalcy. Are you just now heading home? I attempted to infuse a casual warm tone to my voice, but I wasn't sure I pulled it off. Yes, I am driving on the 15. A car horn sounded, then faded, as I heard Jean Charles's sharp intake of breath. The American form of offensive driving was a skill the Parisian had yet to master. He'd spent most of his adult life in the great cities of the world, where owning a car was not only superfluous, it bordered on the insane. New York parking fees regularly equaled the rent for a studio. I shuddered at the thought of him at the wheel while on the phone. A late night then? I chatted as if I hadn't a care in the world. They say compartmentalizing is one of the first signs of mental illness. Oui. The restaurant, it was very busy. These Americans, they like food, Jean-Charles said with classic European understatement. Another car horn sounded, this time answered with a muttered Gallic epithet, which made me smile. The American way, treat each meal as your last, I said, finding my equilibrium. Jean-Charles had opened a gourmet burger joint in the shopping area of the Babylon called the Bazaar, while he perfected the menu and finished out the space that would be his signature restaurant. Precisely. So many, many burgers, pommes frites, shakes, and I am working on the new dishes for the Vegas Lost Chef standing. My kitchenier, she is, how do you say it, a poor stepchild? Found wanting in every way? Yes, this is it. I need my kitchen at Cielo. We are at the mercy of the contractor. You know that. He is working. Perhaps you can do something? Wave my magic wand. Silence stretched between us. I have made you angry. His voice held a note of defeat. No, I'm just... I looked at Dane, his face pulled tight. The woman on the Ferrari, still dead. It's just not a great time. For this, I am sorry. Perhaps tomorrow would be better? Right now, it's not looking so good. But we'll talk about your kitchen soon, I promise. You must help me. You see, I am also nervous. Jean-Charles said the words haltingly, as if confessing a major sin, one he couldn't believe he'd committed. This is a very public stage. My reputation and that of your hotel hang in the balance. This is not only a competition with my fellow chefs. The media is turning it into a circus. Vegas and reality television, the perfect storm of bad taste. Yes, well, with your help, I will adjust and we can make it better. However, right now I am, how do you say it, wrecked? That will do. For some reason, I enjoyed his struggle with American slang, Sometimes his choices made the tawdry charming. I am looking forward to sleep. His voice sounded tired as he deftly changed the subject. But I could not end the day without hearing your voice. I felt like a ping pong ball being smashed from one side to the other. On one side, I was the potential romance. On the other, the hotel exec standing in his way. How this game would play out and which me would win was anybody's guess. I'm glad you called. Yes, but why are you awake? He sounded as if the thought that normal people were asleep at this hour had just occurred to him, which was probably accurate. I had to answer my phone. I know, I know, playing fast and loose with the truth. 
not good. But to be honest, I was having a real hard time with reality right at the moment. After finishing the conversation, I reluctantly hung up, then repocketed my phone, taking my time to savor the sweet taste of a very real fantasy. Turning, I glanced at Dane. He still looked like hell, maybe worse. Underneath it all, he looked guilty, which doused my French glow pretty nicely. Are you going to tell me what's going on? I hissed, my temper flaring again. Add playing games to the long list of things that piss me off. Dane was a master. I wish I knew. His face remained a blank slate, a study in self-control. Cowboy, you know... I was reaching for something to say, measuring my words, trying to resist closing my fingers around his neck when the doors opened. Instinctively, I turned, squinting through the darkness. Like a Hollywood version of a near-death experience, figures moved toward me, silhouetted by the bright light behind them. There was someone here near death, but it wasn't me, so I wasn't too alarmed. Lucky? Romeo called, his voice hushed, as if he had wandered into a church and was afraid to awaken the dead. He needn't have worried. At the sound of the detective's voice, Dane stiffened. Stepping back, he straightened, throwing his shoulders back. With practiced ease, he arranged his features into a bland, impenetrable mask. The man could be as stupid as a bull thrown in with the cows. Lying to me would land him in the doghouse, but lying to the police would move him up the food chain to the big house, if I didn't kill him first. And he wanted my help? He acted as if he'd find my name under the word doormat in the dictionary. Just another bit of proof to my all-men-are-pigs theory. Yes, it's a sad commentary that the survival of the human species rests solely on the low expectations of females. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. But thankfully, I'd never done the nasty with Dane. One minor triumph, all things considered. Over here, I called to Romeo. My voice sounded strangled, as if Dane had put both his hands around my neck and squeezed. Of course, if he did, it might save us both a ton of trouble. Out of the darkness, Las Vegas's finest young detective materialized in front of us, followed by a half dozen officers in uniform and three people in civilian clothes. With his rumpled beige raincoat, wilted shirt, a dark suit that hung on his thin frame, his tie knotted, but hanging loose around his neck, like a noose ready to be tightened, Romeo looked as if he hadn't seen a decent night's sleep or a good meal in a month of Sundays, something I suspected was closer to the truth than I'd care to think. His sandy brown hair, mashed down on one side, held the evidence of a recent wedding and combing. A cowlick stood at the crown of his head like a defiant thistle. The hint of sleep lingered in the corner of his cloudy blue eyes. One cheek held the imprint of something, his hand perhaps, or the corner of a stack of papers, remnants of a quick catnap. When we'd first met, Romeo couldn't hide his emotions. Each one would march bold and unbidden across his face, much to his chagrin. Now he eyed our dead girl with the blank, business-like stare of someone who had seen more than his share of the bad things in life, a fact that broke my heart just a little. I watched and listened as Romeo instructed his men to secure the scene. He supervised them until, apparently satisfied, he turned to me. Pulling a spiral-bound pad from his inside coat pocket, he flipped it open then wetted the end of a stub of pencil on his tongue. Glancing between Dane and me, he said, I should separate you two, go by the book, but with our history, why bother? He turned, focusing his words on me. You're probably eight steps ahead of me already anyway. You gave me the overview on the phone, so just give the rest to me straight, okay? When have I ever not... I trailed off. Better not to open that can of worms. So I did as he asked, straight as I could. As I talked, trying to remember every detail, 
even the seemingly unimportant ones, the young detective scribbled, his brows furrowed. The call from Dane came in at... Dane started to answer. Romeo silenced him with a frown. You'll get your chance, cowboy. I raised my eyebrows at my detective friend. Like a spark, a hint of humor flared in his eyes, then quickly faded. The kid was growing into his badge. Somehow, I didn't feel like celebrating. One more cockeyed optimist thrown under the reality bus. Scrolling through my phone directory to the most recent calls, I said, 242. Romeo made a note. This dealership is a concessionaire, right? He glanced up from his notes. At my nod, he continued, I need to know who owns it and who has access. Frank DeLuca owns the place. Give me an hour to get you the rest. DeLuca? Romeo's brows snapped together, making him look older than 12 and somehow a bit more serious. Perhaps he ought to think about that as a permanent look. Could they do that with Botox? Stress and panic had clearly fractured the few functioning brain cells I had, letting loose random thoughts to ping around my empty skull. Terrific. DeLuca? As in the pro poker player? Romeo continued. I went to Bishop Gorman with a couple of his kids. A local Catholic high school, Bishop Gorman had educated the best and brightest of most of the old Vegas families. One and the same. I'd like to talk to him, the kid muttered as he made a note. Although after that dust-up with his daughter, Romeo's cheeks reddened as he glanced at me and shrugged. Nothing like having history in this burg, huh? I said with a hint of resignation and a sharp nip of reality. A lot of people live here, but it's still a small town. Tell me about it. Weariness hung heavy in his voice. The kid looked barely old enough to drive. How much history could he have? Would you happen to know where I might find Mr. DeLuca? He asked, his pencil poised. You're in luck. He qualified for the Sin City Smackdown. Romeo's face creased with puzzlement. Smackdown? Isn't Mr. DeLuca a bit old for cage fighting? Poker. It's a poker tournament, almost as important as the World Series of Poker. What rock have you been living under? I felt like a creep the minute I said it. I don't normally feast on unseasoned detectives. The hurt look flashing across his face didn't help. Sorry. I forget not everyone lives in my happy little corner of the universe. The Smackdown is the Super Bowl of Texas Hold'em, and this weekend is the final table. The hordes descend today. The nine players who qualified, the media, celebrities wanting some face time, the hookers hoping to land a whale, and folks just needing an excuse to misbehave. Tournament play starts day after tomorrow. Each interminable moment will be televised to the world from Teddy's old theater. There, I'd said his name. Teddy. I held my breath, waiting for a reaction. Nothing happened. My pulse remained steady. My heart didn't constrict to the size of a raisin. Wow. Maybe I was over him. As I let my breath ease between my lips, the ache in my chest returned. Okay. Maybe not completely over him. Oh, Romeo chewed on his lip as his eyes turned toward the ceiling and his brain shifted gears. No cameras in here? It's the only place in the hotel without internal monitoring, if that's what you're getting at. Look around. I swept my arm toward the showroom. There's nothing in here but some expensive Italian iron, nothing much to pocket and take home. So, only the external door alarms, the front door into the bazaar as well as the exterior doors, are wired into hotel security. As the detective opened his mouth to speak, I silenced him with a raised finger. Flipping open my phone, I pushed to talk. Jerry? Lucky? You ever go to bed, girl? The voice that came back belonged to Jerry, our head of security. Me and Jer went way, way back all the way back to the beginning. I kept the guests happy, he kept them safe, flip sides of the same coin. Feeling the burn of their penetrating stares, I turned my back to Romeo and Dane. 
sleep isn't part of my job description, nor yours, apparently. I pressed the phone to my ear and lowered my voice. Did you guys get an alarm on the front door to the Ferrari dealership? Funny you should ask. I was just heading down there. Why? According to my staff, the alarm lit up at... He paused, then said, 203. You guys didn't respond? No. The alarm was silenced with a code shortly after. As procedure dictates, we called down there. The woman who answered the phone had the magic word. But this is coming to me secondhand. I was dealing with what's looking to be more and more like an inside ring of thieves working the guest rooms when I was called away to handle one of the poker players in town for the big wing ding. Not only is he a whiz at poker, he's a pretty good card counter, too. So you enlightened him as to the dim view we take of that skill? Hell, he'd already been enlightened. We had him under contract not to play blackjack. Guess the lure of a new shoe, a young dealer, and the time of night got to him. What did you do? I'll probably regret it, but I gave him a slap on the wrist and let him go. I didn't finish up with him until just a couple of minutes ago. Wanted to scare him a little. You're going soft on me. If that got around, it'd be regarded as an invitation, I half joked. Yeah, well, maybe they'll give me my gold watch. They'd be doing me a favor. But before you put me in for early retirement, the kid was deaf. I cut him a break. Some of the other players had been hassling him, and it ticked me off. Gotcha. Had he qualified for the SmackDown, or was he a hanger-on? Neither. He's a player, but he missed the final table by a few spots. Finished pretty high in the qualifying, as I understand it, though. He was flashing a water round. Inviting attention. Thankfully, not my problem. But this alarm at the dealership. That one has landed in my lap. Anything more you can tell me? Not much. That's why I was coming to check it out myself. If she had the proper word, what piqued your interest? Alarms were double-checked with a phone call. Each authorized person was assigned a unique code word. If they could repeat that word when security called, then all was clear, and security had no other duty to perform. The time of night raised a red flag, although test-driving a Ferrari at two in the morning isn't that out of a request. Seen it before. Jerry sounded like he was reciting statistics as he gave me the rundown. But to be honest, a woman with the owner's code word? I know DeLuca's a player. Runs through the ladies like a slot addict through quarters. But the kid who took the call didn't ask to speak to Mr. DeLuca. A breach in protocol, he should have known better. But at least he had the sense to find me and tell me about it. I reamed him a new one, then called the dealership back. But the gal didn't pick up. When I finished with the deaf kid, I thought I'd better check it out myself. Your call caught me in the lobby heading toward the dealership. I got this one covered. I stared at the girl on the car. Thankfully, someone had stopped the rotating. But our system apparently has a fatal flaw. What was the code word? You and I both know that if someone's intent on jumping into a buzzsaw, there's not much we can do to stop them. Hang on. I waited, then Jerry's voice came back on the line. The word was, well, it was actually a phrase, dead man's hand. DeLuca drew to that one year to win a World Series of Poker bracelet, the stuff of legend, but it's sort of creeping me out right now. So no one asked the woman where DeLuca was? Apparently not. I didn't bother trying again. I figured she'd left by now. She's gone all right. I glanced at the girl. Two technicians were bagging her hands. One of them pawed through her jeweled feed bag of a purse. The tech pulled out a lipstick and a couple of condoms in pink wrappers. He shook his head at Romeo. Do you happen to know when you called down here? I asked Jerry. Yeah, Jerry paused. 221. These iPhones are amazing. All the information at your fingertips. Got it. 18 minutes after the alarm sounded, then another 20, give or take, until Dane called me. You going to tell me what happened? Concern crept around the edges of Jerry's weary voice. Your woman didn't leave. 
Somebody buried the heel of a shoe in her neck. The pointy end punctured something important. She bled out all over a new California. I'll need a list of everyone who had access. Keep all the tapes from the cameras in the hallway and those outside showing the external doors to the dealership. You know the drill. I rattled this off as if murder was as common as a drunk locking himself out of his room. They killed her with a shoe? He has a certain style, I said. Romeo's here. Are you going to be around for a while? Now I am. Jerry sounded as if the world had just been dropped on his shoulders. Besides, I got some paperwork to do on this rash of room robberies, but I was going to ignore that until tomorrow. Sitting behind the desk where the buck stops is overrated, isn't it? Can I meet you in security in an hour? I glanced at my watch. Wow. Apparently, time also flew when you weren't having any fun. I thought this was a good thing, but I couldn't marshal the brain power to think it through. Make that an hour and a half. You got it. As I closed my phone and stuffed it back into the pocket of my pajama bottoms, I turned back to the young detective, who stared at me with old eyes. I gave him a quick and dirty recap of my conversation. He'd already heard my side of it. Glossing over the code word thing, I bartered a bit of self-respect for some sniffing around time. If you're done with me, I said, trying not to feel guilty about my contribution to his downward spiral into the morass of cynicism. I've got to dress for the day, then I have some other fires to put out. He nodded. But I know, I said, interrupting him. Don't leave town. Finally, that got a grin out of the kid, which made me feel hopeful. Your leash isn't that long, he fired back. I was about to bite off a stinging reply when the kid's grin faded. I started to ask you if you have any idea who this woman is. No ID in her purse. The look on his face telegraphed his desire for easy answers. Since she had a code to silence the alarm and call off the dogs, one could assume she either worked here or knew someone who does. And if that is the case, whoever that is has some answering to do. I'd pointed him in the right direction, which made me feel a little better about not giving him the whole story. As an insider myself, I owed Frank DeLuca a chance to explain how the woman ended up with his code word before I turned the cops onto him. That's the way the game was played. But holding out on Romeo didn't sit too well either. That's not how our game was played. I'd make it up to the kids somehow. Mr. DeLuca isn't going to like this one bit. Romeo paled. From the looks of him, his fracas with Mr. DeLuca's daughter had included a run-in with the man himself, which was good. Knowing the kid, he'd put DeLuca at the bottom of his interview list, buying me some time. I put a hand on his arm. Before we go any further, could you do me a favor? Check her bra. A lot of the girls carry their licenses and mad money there to outfox the purse snatchers and pickpockets. Mad money? If your date gets mad, you can still pay a cab to take you home. It's a girl thing. I see. Romeo didn't make a note of that little tidbit. We'll look, but even still, I'd appreciate it if you could do a bit of digging. Maybe come up with a name? Great. The young detective who had barely graduated from training wheels was throwing me in with the wolves. Of course, that was the role I played. After all, being Albert Rothstein's daughter did open a few doors and would give me a few minutes head start before anyone started shooting. He'd been so quiet and still that I'd forgotten he was even there, which, given his considerable charms, I had heretofore considered an impossibility. I can tell you who she is, Dane said, his voice flat, hard, yet with a tremor of emotion. Romeo and I turned toward him. You know her? I asked, not even trying to keep the incredulity out of my voice. Unfortunately, Dane's eyes captured mine. She's my wife. Chapter Two Fighting to keep calm, I stared at the man I had known for almost six months, the man who had tried numerous times to worm his way into my life, 
not to mention into my pants. The man I had kissed in the garden bar, for Christ's sake. He had a wife? In my book, there are different levels of lying by omission. Gradation starting with the little white lie that did no one any harm and could be overlooked. Progressing to holding your cards close until you knew who could be trusted, which was potentially forgivable. And culminating with the omission so glaring, so deceitful, that drawing a terminal amount of blood was a given. Dane had just shot that arrow, an arrow tipped with the poison of betrayal. Just as I was working myself up to homicide, I remembered reading somewhere that losing a spouse is one of life's most devastating events, which inched me back from the verge. Ah, the delicate tightrope one walks when a friend turns out to be far less than expected. Disappointment, one of life's greatest conundrums. And I could be big, in theory. So I'd try to be appreciative of his pain, but I needed some answers. Even if I had to hogtie the man and threaten him with a branding iron, I was going to get them. Dane took a deep breath and ran his fingers through his hair. Her name is, was, Sylvie. Staring over my shoulder at his wife's body, his carefully constructed mask slipped away, leaving raw emotion, but not the pain I expected. I fought the urge to reach out, squeeze his arm. Actually, it was Svetlana. She was from Latvia. We met during my first tour in Afghanistan. She wanted to come to the U.S. I was lonely, naive, a stupid cowboy from Lubbock. Riveted, Romeo and I didn't move a muscle. I wasn't sure either of us was breathing. The base commander married us, and that was the beginning of the nightmare. Dane gave a half laugh, rueful and self-deprecating, as he glanced at me. As my mother never misses a chance to remind me, bringing Sylvie into our family was like letting a coyote in with the sheep. Several emotions traveled across his face. Anger, fear, something else. After my first tour ended, we came back to the States. She was as sweet as the scent of sage under the warm sun, until all her paperwork came through. Then she turned on me like a cornered rattler. She hated West Texas, hated me, hated my family. After a couple of brushes with the law, she disappeared, and good riddance. You didn't divorce her? Why this was the question I chose to ask, I couldn't fathom. Maybe it was because his rating on my creep meter hinged on his answer. I was sent back overseas, this time to Iraq. Not having anything to come home to, I volunteered to stay. The army wasn't about to turn me down. They were in desperate need of war-tested officers who spoke the local lingo. I'd only been out six months when I showed up on your doorstep. I see. I hired a lawyer when I got to Nevada, but since I had no idea where Sylvie might be, I couldn't exactly send a process server to hit her with papers. So, I had to publish notices in the paper. A long rigmarole, which took time. But the paperwork has been done, and the first notice is due out in the review journal this Sunday. Whoever killed your wife significantly streamlined the legal process for you, didn't they? said Romeo. If Romeo's question knocked Dane off center, I couldn't tell. I didn't kill her, if that's what you're driving at. This is a no-fault state. Divorces are easy to get, and certainly not worth a felony conviction. The detective paused for a moment, staring at Dane, measuring. Your wife wasn't trying to shake you down or anything, was she? I'd hear from her periodically. Always a hurried phone call from some truck stop or cheap motel. She moved around a lot. A hard look flashed across Dane's face. Of course, she was always running low on funds and in some trouble. Although, she never sounded too panicked. Believe me, the woman could take care of herself. Did you give her money? Romeo didn't even glance up from his pad as he scribbled notes. Sometimes. I'd wire her just enough to get out of the scrape she was in, but not enough to run too far. 
I thought if I could get a bead on her, I could, well, I could solve a few of my own problems. But she was always one step ahead. What kind of problems? This time Romeo looked up, his eyes steady, unreadable, his expression open, encouraging. Once in a blue moon, she'd call my folks, hassle them. My father has a bad ticker. Her last call put him in the hospital for a week. I told him she was blowing smoke. She wouldn't hurt them and couldn't hurt me. But he's a stubborn cuss, tough as an old boot, and as ornery as a longhorn. Apparently not as tough as he thinks, I said. Why would she care about them? She was looking for me, he trailed off. They wouldn't tell her where I was. The whole thing upset them tremendously. He paused, collecting himself. Once she got the bit in her teeth, she took it and ran with it. She wouldn't let go. A beautiful face with a mile-wide mean streak, I summarized. Pretty isn't always as pretty does, is it? I asked, because apparently I needed to rub a little salt in his wound as salve for my own. Not a proud moment. The minute the words escaped, I felt a flush of shame. I needed to get a grip. If you found your wife, what was your plan? Romeo prompted. Divorce her ass and hand her over to the Immigration and Naturalization Service? He glanced at me. They're the ones who kick illegals out, right? In theory, I said, not wanting to open that can of worms. Vegas had more than its share of illegals and I'd never seen even one of them shipped back to wherever they came from. But that was above my pay grade. We rounded them up. What the government did with them after that was anybody's guess. Whatever it was, most of them were back within a day or two, with new identities, applying for the same job. They can send her to hell for all I care. That'd be one heck of a bus ride, I remarked, because sarcasm hid the hurt. This time when Sylvie called, it was different, wasn't it? Romeo probed. Once the kid latched on, he was like a tick on a dog. Yeah, not only was she right in my backyard, but this time she was scared. Really spooked, you know? Dane looked at me. I nodded, but again resisted any show of sympathy. Even if I believed him, I wasn't letting him off the hook that easily. Someone was following her. At least she thought they were, and they wanted to kill her. He glanced at the lifeless form of his former wife. Guess that much she got right. What did she get wrong? I asked. Huh? Dane went still as his eyes met mine. You said that much she got right. That implies she got something wrong. What? I didn't mean it literally. Dane's eyes shifted to look over my shoulder. It's just a saying. I see, I said, as I captured his eyes and stared him down. Why did I have the feeling the guy was being as honest as a card sharp in a rigged game? Did she say who was after her or why? Romeo asked. He paused in his note taking as his gaze drifted between Dane and me. Shifting his attention to Romeo, Dane pressed his lips into a thin line and shook his head. No, she called me during the poker game, around one. She said she'd play for a while, maybe an hour more. Pretend everything was business as usual. Her words, not mine. So somebody was watching her. That was the impression I got, not only from her comment, but from the way she talked. She was holding her cards close, acting like... Maybe somebody was eavesdropping. Was she still playing when she called? No, taking a break. So it could have been anybody in the room who was listening, Romeo said under his breath, as if talking to himself, as he jotted a note. When he'd finished, he looked up, meeting Dane's eyes. She wanted you to meet her here? No. Dane's eyes held steady. His voice didn't waver. She wanted to meet me in Delilah's. Then how? She didn't show, okay? Dane bit off the reply. Taking a deep breath, he paused and ran a hand through his hair. I fell for it, even after all this time. Christ, I'm a fool.
Fell for what? If that woman was a pro at anything, it was giving me the slip. He chewed on his lip and turned inward. From the look on his face, the conversation he was having with himself was heated. I'd given up finding her and was on my way to the garage when I noticed the door to this place. It hanging open at this hour didn't seem right. Personally, none of this seemed right, but I didn't say that part. I was willing to acknowledge that the time he spent looking for her could explain some of the time gap in his story, between the alarm and his call to me. Did she work here? I asked. Dane shook his head. Sylvie didn't work. She found a sucker, then bled him dry. Did it ever occur to you that you might be walking in on something going down? I asked Dane. The guy should have stupid tattooed on his forehead. It occurred to me, Dane shot me a glare, but I'm pretty good at taking care of myself. So you went and pulled a Lone Ranger. I thought I could handle it. Well, cowboy, it didn't quite work out so good now, did it? Didn't the guy know even the Lone Ranger had Tonto? Then it hit me. Was that the role he expected me to play? Without a glance at Dane, I turned on my heel and forced myself to walk calmly toward the land of the living. Wringing the man's neck was starting to look like a viable solution to several problems, which had me worried. Usually, I didn't resort to contemplating homicide this early in the game. A killer had recently been in this room, breathing the same air. Was murderous intent communicable? Who knew? Regardless, with bloodlust coursing through my veins, I knew I needed to put some distance between me and prime suspect number one before I creased his skull with a tire iron. Once out of the showroom, rational thought trickled in, filling some of the emotional gaps in my logic. Calmness, okay, a diminished level of murderous intent, returned as I ducked under a paper sign that had come loose from its mooring and now dangled, one end still firmly affixed to the ceiling, the other dragging the ground. The sign, hand-painted in red on butcher paper, welcomed all the poker players. I wondered what Nimrod had approved it. Had the request come through my office, I would have required the banner to be professionally printed. Quality control, a never-ending quest in an increasingly tacky world. Crossing the hallway, I pushed through the service doors, turned to the right, and headed down a back hallway leading toward the main building of the hotel. Somehow, I didn't have it in me to traipse through the public areas in my purple flannels and ripped and worn Rebels t-shirt, even though the hotel would be sparsely populated at this hour. And to be honest, no one would pay any attention anyway. My thoughts returned to Dane and Homicide, it's funny how often those went hand in hand, like peanut butter and jelly, or guns and bullets. Perhaps I was overplaying my hand, making the punishment worse than the crime. I wasn't that mad. Well, maybe about the Lone Ranger thing, and the lying thing, and the being married but not wearing the hardware thing. Okay, I was seriously steamed, and scared. Yep, the emotions were redlining. Not good, and so not helpful when trying to problem solve. A set of spring-loaded double doors on my left flew inward. I dodged two housekeepers, staggering under armfuls of neatly folded, bright white towels. Pressing my back to the wall, I waited until they passed. From behind their towers of terry cloth, they never saw me, jabbering as if they hadn't a care in the world. What was that like? I couldn't remember. And why did it feel as if I had an anvil sitting on my chest? My knees threatened to buckle under the weight. Leaning my head back, I closed my eyes and focused on the cool, hard surface of the wall under my shoulders. I took a moment to simply breathe, pulling as much air into my tight chest as possible. With each breath, the panic subsided, and I started seeing stars. Too little air will kill you. Too much will make you hyperventilate. There was a lesson in there somewhere, but balance had never been my forte. Pushing myself from the wall, I continued toward the main hotel, willing myself to walk slowly, to think. 
there was very little worse than an emoting female who threw logic out the window. And that was so not me. At least, not the me I used to be. The before Teddy me. But I didn't want to think about that now. I couldn't think about that now. I needed to figure out where I stood on Mr. Paxton Dane. Assuming I swallowed his story, there were gaps in time and evidence at the scene, not to mention a circumstantial case that was starting to look pretty incriminating. And the whole song and dance about Sylvie needing money didn't jibe with her Jimmy Choo's. Not only the shoes, but the fancy handbag as well. Of course, they could have been gifts, but any way I looked at it, the man had murderer written all over him. And I didn't have to be Judge Judy to figure out that's exactly where the police would take it. They had to. But Dane couldn't be a killer, could he? I'd seen enough of life to know that we all could resort to homicide if properly provoked. After all, my mother, Mona, had pushed me perilously close so many times that now my neurons automatically flipped to the pissed off position when excited by the electrical snap of her aura. Had Dane crossed the line? After ducking up the service stairs to the mezzanine, I paused at my office door. Stilling myself, I turned my focus inward. When all else failed, I'd learned to trust my gut instinct, my intuition. It hadn't let me down yet, at least not when I'd been smart enough to listen. This time, obviously under the influence of a serious case of wishful thinking, my gut told me Dane couldn't be a killer. A creep, maybe. Something he shared with most of the Y chromosome set. But he wasn't a shoe-wielding madman. My gut also told me the stakes were, well, life and death. Death for his wife, and life without parole for Dane. I needed answers, and I needed them fast. Once Romeo started poking around, I'd be SOL. Nothing made casino people clam up faster than a bunch of nosy cops. After a quick dance between the droplets in my office shower, I dressed for battle, trading flannel and fuzzy slippers for silk and ferragamos. Although it was only 4 a.m., give or take, my day had started, like it or not. With one last glance in the mirror on the back of the closet door, I fluffed my hair, not entirely sure the woman who looked back was, in fact, me. My hair had been bottle blonde for so long, I still wasn't used to the natural light brown, the result of a fairly recent makeover. Despite the improvements, recent history had taken its toll. Wrinkles had sprouted, creasing previously unmarred skin. My eyes were tired, my expression cautious, my smile a memory. No doubt some of this was due to Teddy. I had handed him my heart, and he, well, he left. And when he'd left, he had taken a part of me. I leaned closer to my reflection and narrowed my eyes. Apparently, he'd taken the good part. We had unfinished business, that man and me. And when I saw him again, I hoped I'd be smart enough not to shoot him. But all bets were off. Taking the high road wasn't my best thing. After making a half-hearted attempt with some eyeshadow, blush, and other still foreign potions, I gave up. Nothing was going to save this face. Not today, anyway. Guess I'd have to count on my blue eyes and high cheekbones to keep from scaring small children. Not much to hang the shreds of feminine vanity on, but it was all I had, so I went with it. In a vain effort to look polished and professional, I stuck the big, square-cut diamonds in each earlobe, gifts from my mother in a weak moment. Then I latched around my neck a large matching diamond on a platinum chain, a gift from myself in a weak moment. Out of ideas for further self-improvement, I kicked the closet door shut on my reflection, grabbed my sweater from the back of a chair, then shrugged into it as I made my way to the front of the office. The message light on my assistant Brandy's desk phone blinked, a scolding red eye in the semi-darkness. I ignored it. It was probably bad news, and I'd had enough of that already. Bounding down the stairs two at a time, I pushed through the fire door at the bottom into the main lobby of the Babylon. At this time of night, it was a veritable mausoleum. 
Okay, not quite the right metaphor. Briefly, I squeezed my eyes shut. But being very visual, I couldn't chase away the sight of the girl, Dane's wife, Sylvie, on the car. Covering ground with long strides, I charted a course through the casino. With a practiced eye, I took stock of my surroundings. Tonight, with a bit more attention to detail than usual. Of course, I didn't really expect to find a murderer lurking behind a potted palm, but with me, hope always sprang eternal. The Babylonian theme redolent in the rest of the hotel was on full display in the casino. The carpets, brightly colored woven mosaics, grand enough for a royal's tent, provided a comfortable cushion, muting the noise in addition to setting the stage. The walls were painted a dark, rich purple and trimmed with gold. Torches, real flame encased in blown glass at the ends of bundles of faux reeds, hung from the walls and the columns dotting the casino. They cast a subtle, flickering light, as inviting as logs on a fire. Multicolored cloth tented above Delilah's bar, which sat on a raised platform in the center of the casino. A wall of water cascaded down a sandstone wall behind the burnished mahogany counter. Flowering bougainvillea climbed trellises, giving the space a hidden, secretive feel. Action in the casino was winding down. Guests filled no more than half of the stools in front of the slots. Play at the various tables had been consolidated. Piped in music, a low, thumping beat struggled in vain to keep the energy level high. Only a few brave souls, too drunk or too tired to go to bed, still pressed buttons on the video poker machines set into the bar top in Delilah's. The baby grand in the corner sat silent, abandoned. Teddy used to play that piano. I shut my heart to the pain as I sailed past. A lone bartender wiping a glass with a rag returned my nod. Cocktail waitresses shivered in skimpy uniforms as they balanced on high heels. I caught myself looking at their feet. Not one of their most ogled body parts, I felt certain. I didn't think I'd find a pair of Jimmy Choo's. They weren't exactly work shoes designed for a day spent on your feet. Nor were they within financial reach of the normal working girl. Well, maybe the working girls, but not the cocktail hostesses. Although, in Vegas... Sometimes those lines blurred. Stilettos graced the feet of the few girls who remained. They were part of the uniform, the illusion. One pretty young thing sported a pair of kick-ass, bright red, there's-no-place-like-home slingbacks with peep toes. She looked world-weary and anxious. It was long past a decent hour. Probably a new hire stuck on the graveyard shift. But those shoes were grade A. When she turned and walked away, I glimpsed a red soul. Lubu's. I was momentarily overcome with shoe lust. However, heeding the call of duty, I resisted stopping to ask her where she had bought them and kept looking. No sparkly Jimmy Choo's. Not a one. And one was the critical number. Since I actually knew where one of the shoes was, I was only looking for its mate. How would that work? I had no idea. Where was Prince Charming when I needed him? He had plenty of experience with one glass slipper. Guess I'd leave that to the police as well. The shoe part, I mean. Despite my miserable track record, I still felt I could handle the Prince Charming part. Self-delusional to the end. A fitting epitaph. But I wasn't going to think about that either. In contrast to the subdued vibe of the casino, the poker room was firing on all cylinders. The mood was hushed, but energy shimmered off the crowd clustered at the railing dividing the poker room from the main casino. Worried about cheating, most casinos prohibited non-players from huddling too close to the action. Ours was no exception. Tonight, the throng was at least three deep. The thousand-dollar buy-in Sylvie had played in had finished up. The table was empty, Presumably a winner had been declared, and the players had wandered off to find more action, celebrate their winnings, lick their wounds, or die on the hood of a Ferrari. Vegas, the town of endless possibilities. The high-stakes marquee action played out at the tables nearest to the railing. 
At the front table, eight players matched wits and nerves at a high-stakes game. Among the players, I recognized two pros, both trying to look bored as they listened to music through earbuds, and a top-ranked amateur who had won a World Series of Poker bracelet several years ago and made serious money through an offshore internet poker site he'd formed. Two of our regular high-roller whales were seated across from each other. One of them looked less than confident, a fact I felt sure had the pros circling like wolves around a wounded fawn. The other players hadn't hit my radar, but among them was an older woman. I liked it. High-stakes poker was notoriously unwelcoming to women, as if somehow a dose of estrogen would completely counteract all that testosterone and render the men ineffectual. Oh, if wishing would only make it so. Each player carefully guarded the stacks of chips in front of him, the number and color of which provided an easily readable measure of the player's success. It looked like the amateur was just joining the game. One of the pros had drawn the most blood, but the older woman was holding her own. All in all, the stacks weren't too disparate in size or color, so the game was just ramping up. Far from an expert, I did a quick calculation. Each stack ran to the hundreds of thousands. Hence the crowd, hence the energy. As I eased through the small, gated entrance, raised voices captured my attention. One of the voices seemed a bit garbled, yet while the words weren't sharp, the anger came through loud and clear. The other voice, low and demeaning, I recognized instantly. It belonged to our longtime poker room manager, Marvin J. Johnstone, a pain in the ass who kept his job simply because the casino manager was too scared to fire him. I would have been delighted to can his ass, but from my perch on the corporate ladder, such a task was beneath my pay grade. Marvin, who preferred to be addressed as Marvin J., but who was mostly not so fondly referred to as the Stone Man, had attached himself to the big boss, our fearless leader, back before the earth was cool. As the big boss moved from property to property, clawing his way up the food chain, so too did Marvin. But Marvin, a parasite living off the host, reached his high-water mark at middle management, where he had been abusing the staff ever since. He was a small man, natalie attired in black tie, with sallow skin, a long, pinched face, and closely set, dark eyes. He reminded me of a ferret. Well, a ferret with a really bad comb-over. The stone man and a young man in blue jeans sporting a head of shaggy dark hair, a soul patch under his lower lip, and an angry stare, faced off behind the lone open chair at the high stakes table. Forgive me, sir, the stone man said, not looking the least bit sorry. You may not play at this table. Arms moving animatedly, the young man opened his mouth and spoke, but the words sounded as if they'd been spoken underwater. Red-faced, with a sheen of perspiration, the stone man raised an eyebrow as he ran a finger under his collar, tugging as if it were too tight. He crossed his arms, a look of exaggerated patience tinged with a hint of disdain settling over his features. Clearly, Marvin considered dealing with the young man an act of kindness worthy of canonization. With his patience obviously held by a thin tether, the young man whirled to a man standing behind him and began signing rapidly. I never knew anger could infuse silent, signed words. When the young man was done, he whirled back to the stone man as his friend interpreted for him. Mr. Johnstone, my friend here has all the prerequisites with this hotel to participate in this game. I can only assume that you are denying him the open chair because he is deaf. He doesn't have the star power to play at the premier table. I mean, who wants to watch some handicapped kid play? My anger instantly redlined. My eyes closed to slits as I advanced on our poker room manager. Is there a problem? The stone man started to bite off a reply, but when he saw me, his eyes widened and he clamped his mouth shut. Wise man. I had him by about six inches. 30 pounds, 70 IQ points, and multiple rungs on the corporate ladder. 
The young man's interpreter needlessly explained the situation. The stone man, flying in the face of every corporate policy I was aware of, and I knew them all, I'd written the book, was using his own biases to deny a legitimate player, fully vetted and fully funded, a place in the primo game. Because the kid was deaf. And in doing so, he not only exposed the hotel to legal ramifications, he offended me on every level. I turned to the stone man, pulled myself to my full height, conjured Donald Trump, and said simply, you're fired. Normally firing people gave me hives. This was not one of those times. The room fell silent. The games stopped. Marvin Jay's already red face flushed crimson as he breathed heavily, putting a song in my heart. Hey, Shallow is my middle name. I take my jollies where I find them, a character flaw I've learned to embrace. Defensively, the young poker player took a step back, giving us space. You can't fire me, the stone man hissed. Nervously, he wet his lips with his tongue. I half expected it to be forked. I just did. You've been begging for it for years, and tonight you happen to hit me when I am hardwired to the pissed off position. And the planets had aligned to make me the right person, in the right place, at the right time. How I love synchronicity. But I didn't say that part. Holding his gaze with mine, I flipped open my phone and pushed to talk. Security, please send a team to the poker room. Mr. Johnstone has been fired, and I wish you to escort him off the premises. You are a god among mortals, Jerry said with an awe-filled chuckle. Once the staff gets wind of this, you could be elected emperor. A thankless job, more work, less pay, and generally terminated with a beheading. Giving credence to the adage that no good deed goes unpunished. Perfect. I just love being the proof to a cliché. Actually, cliché whore that I am, that did have a sort of perverted appeal, but I'd never admit to it. Your security team is 20 seconds away. Thanks. Enjoying this far more than I should, I snapped my phone shut with a flourish and repocketed it. The big boss will have your head, Marvin spluttered, his face mottled, his breath coming in short gasps. When he leaned in, his breath smelled like amaretto or something nutty, and his eyes were a bit wild. I wondered if he'd been drinking. Just because you're his daughter. My eyes narrowed even more as I lowered my voice and whispered into our now former poker room manager's ear, before you play that card, I'd think it through. Marvin snapped his mouth shut, and for the first time, realization dawned in his eyes. His demeanor changed, his face softened. He wrung his hands as he looked up at me with those tiny, feral eyes. He squinted like a rat seeing the sun after a night in the sewers, or like a man with a serious hangover. He was sweating pretty good now. Beads of water trickled off his forehead. There's been a misunderstanding, Miss O'Toole. You're reading this all wrong. I was planning to call someone from the list, so the young man couldn't have the seat. Policy states you resort to the list to keep the table full only if you don't have any qualified players waiting to play. I raised a questioning eyebrow at the young man. Mr. Weston, the interpreter said. Mr. Weston is to take the chair. I waved to the two security guards pushing through the throng at the railing. And the only misunderstanding is yours, Marvin. A grant of power does not include the license to abuse it. You're finished here. And if you don't leave now, I'll see that you're finished in Vegas. I'd always wanted to say that. And much to my delight, I sounded like a petty hood from one of those horrible old mobster movies. That wasn't my Vegas, but I was having fun, so I went with it. However, I did resist rolling out my Robert De Niro impersonation. But I wouldn't go too far. The police are going to want to talk to you. One of the guards grabbed Marvin by the arm and urged him toward the exit. The guy was a reptile, but he was smart enough to know my threat was far from hollow. I'm not done with you, the stone man spat as he allowed the guard to lead him away. 
All eyes followed the threesome until the crowd swallowed them. No one said a word as I sighed and blew a lock of hair out of my eyes. Boy, getting to be the one who finally fired the stone man. I was living at the foot of the cross. The sound of clapping broke the silence. Starting in the back of the room, at first only a few hands came together. Then, like a wave hitting the shoals, the sound grew until the whole room joined in the crescendo. Startled, I slowly rotated. Everywhere I looked, I gazed into smiling eyes. The staff, the players, all stood as they applauded me. Rachel, the assistant poker room manager, rushed to my side. Not yet out of her twenties, she looked at me through red-rimmed eyes as big as saucers. Puffy and bloodshot, her eyes reminded me of long nights spent dealing with people betting more than they could afford to lose. You have no idea what you have done, she said, her voice breathless, as if after a long sprint. I rolled my eyes and swiped at that stubborn strand of hair once again. I have an idea, I sighed. What I had done was create one more major pain in the ass to be dealt with. Preferring dignity, Marvin might have left the room quietly, but he wouldn't go without a fuss. Poker room manager was a cherry job. Most would sacrifice body parts to keep it. I had no doubt Marvin J. Johnstone was no exception, and the body parts sacrificed would be mine. The rodent would take a few bites out of my ass before I was rid of him. Oh well. That's why they paid me the big bucks. Not to mention, my ass could use a little whittling. Rachel, you are now the acting poker room manager. Can you handle that? Yes, ma'am, she said with conviction. Youthful enthusiasm. Mine had left so long ago and so quickly, I don't even remember it packing for the trip. You understand I don't have the authority to make your position permanent. The casino manager will make that decision. She nodded curtly, then turned to the room. With a few nonverbal signals, she launched her staff, and they busied themselves ensuring the games currently in play resumed with the minimum of fuss. Timers needed to be reset, cards and chips checked, and every player needed to be reminded where their game was in the betting, what the blinds were, and when they would increase. Rules needed to be rigidly followed. The gaming control board was sticky about that, I turned to young Mr. Weston. A handsome kid, he eyed me with a mixture of disdain and amusement, a hard, steely stare tempered with challenge. His arms hung at his sides, his fingers twitched as if he was muttering under his breath, aching to tell me off. One shoulder seemed to dip under the weight of the chip it carried. Couldn't fault him there. This called for serious sucking up. I looked him in the eye and touched him lightly on the arm. The deaf people I knew spoke as much with touch as they did with their hands. Since he played poker, I assumed he could read lips. I am so sorry. I apologize for the rudeness of my former colleague. Please, the seat is yours. I pulled out the chair for him. With a slight nod and enough hesitation to make me think he might refuse, he accepted my invitation. A steward brought a tray of chips and set it in front of him. Now all business, the kid fell to counting his chips and arranging them to suit himself. He didn't make eye contact with any of the other players. They seemed to be ignoring him as well. Part of the game. However, I'd played enough to know, through their feigned disinterest, every player was meticulously noting habits and expressions of his fellow warriors. During at least the first hour of play, they would play tight, going to school on each other. Each one would be looking for tells, subconscious signs a player might give that would indicate what kind of hand he was holding, whether he was bluffing or not, whether his card had come on the river, or whether he was betting the bundle on less than stellar odds. To me, watching a poker game was as scintillating as trimming the lawn with nail clippers, but for reasons best not explored, the game seemed to hold men spellbound. You may converse with Mr. Weston prior to the game starting and during the breaks, I said to the interpreter. In fact, it would be beneficial if you could interpret the rules as they are being given to the table. 
But I would appreciate it if you would not communicate while the game is in progress. One hand, one player. I trust you know the drill. Understood. I raised an eyebrow at the game steward, who was standing within earshot. He nodded in understanding. Leaving the operation of the game to the pros, I wandered to the back of the room to observe the play occurring there. Sidling in next to the game steward, I stopped and watched for a moment. The gamesmanship was subtle, but it was there. It took guile and cojones to play poker. Something it seemed the former Mrs. Dane had in spades. How long have you been monitoring play? I asked the steward at my side. My shift started at midnight. I rotated to this table an hour ago. Stepping away from the table, I motioned for him to follow me. With a nod, he summoned another steward to take his place. Do you remember a young woman, platinum hair, silver dress? I asked when we were comfortably out of earshot. She busted out of the thousand dollar buy-in a few hours ago. The young man gave me a grin. Miss O'Toole, I'm young, male, and have a pulse. I fought back a grin. I'll take that as a yes. Did you notice anything unusual about her? She wasn't at my table, but I could tell she played pretty aggressively for a girl. Pausing, he blushed when he realized what he had said. No offense, ma'am. After that remark, it's sir to you. At his stricken look, I said, I'm kidding. Anything else you notice about her? Well, not that jumped out, but she did cause a bit of a dust up between Rachel and the stone Mr. Johnson. He colored at his near faux pas. This time, when I fought with my smile, my smile won, surprising me. I thought it had gone on tour with Teddy. Really? What about? I don't know. The kid cast a furtive glance at Rachel. I'm speaking out of turn here, but since it's you, whatever it was, it was pretty serious. Mr. Johnstone was really angry. Rachel was crying when the silver dress lady left. Did you notice the silver dress lady leave with anyone? Did anyone pay more attention to her than they should? Half the room couldn't keep their eyes off her, and she left while I was dealing with a break and a reset of the blinds at my table. Anything else you notice? The game broke up pretty soon after she left. The amateur cleaned everyone out. Nobody was too happy about it. Excepting him, of course. He paused, pursing his lips and narrowing his eyes in concentration. I let him think. Finally, he said, There was one other thing. I don't know if it's important, but Mr. Johnstone left the poker room right after. Left? I crossed my arms and leveled a stern gaze on the young man. Really? Managers don't just abandon the room when high-stakes games are getting underway. I thought it was weird, too. The kid's eyes widened. Sincerity infused his features. He wasn't gone long. And when he came back, he ducked into the back for a minute. If you ask me, he looked sort of spook-eyed, like he'd seen a ghost or something. I struggled to keep my face a mask. News of Sylvie Dane's fatal foot fetish was still under wraps. Anything else leap out at you? The kid chewed on his lip, then shook his head slowly. So you didn't happen to notice she was cheating? Chapter Three Cheating? The young man's Adam's apple bobbed up and down as he paled. How? What color were her eyes? Now, in addition to looking half sick, the steward looked confused and a bit dreamy. Blue. She wore sunglasses, but I'm sure they were blue, he announced like a lovesick schoolboy. God, responsibility was so wasted on the young. Yes, I said, feeling ancient, but not the same color of blue. One was light blue, the other a muddier blue. Still, the light didn't dawn. A red contact lens, I said, dispensing with the clues. But that's illegal in Nevada, the young man said, a bit louder than I'd have liked. Heads turned in our direction. With a finger to my lips, I shushed him as I pulled him farther from the action. Cheating is certainly illegal. 
while fitting anyone with a red contact lens isn't technically against the law, it's certainly strongly frowned upon. The thought made my blood simmer. A magical place. Vegas painted a pretty picture when folks colored between the lines. She was marking cards. The red contact lens allowed her to see the mark. I know it may come as a shock, but people do nefarious things all the time here. He looked at me as if he didn't know what nefarious meant. But if she was cheating, why did she lose? Before I could wrap my brain around that, my father's voice sounded at my elbow, and the young steward eased back toward his table. Isn't it a bit early for you to be causing your usual ruckus? A Las Vegas legend, Albert Rothstein, otherwise known as the Big Boss, had been in the casino business so long, he could wax poetic about the days when the strip was a two-lane road, the Rat Pack was the hottest ticket in town, and Sinatra used to hang out at the garden room at the Sands, chowing down on the 99-cent special and abusing the staff. My father's start in the business was a bit murky, adding to his mystique, but with a nose for money, an uncanny knack for managing his balance sheet, and an unerring ability to avoid even the hint of impropriety, he had risen to the top of the heap in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. A glamorous position, if you didn't mind mongrels nipping at your heels. Of course, when he'd hired me as a cabana girl when I was 15 and had lied about my age, I didn't know he was my father. A little secret he and my mother had only recently let me in on. They'd had their reasons for keeping it to themselves, and, while I sort of understood, I still hadn't quite forgiven either one of them. But no one is guaranteed a perfect life, and, all things considered, mine was darn close. Well, if you ignore my unerring penchant for picking the wrong guy. However, I couldn't blame anyone else for that, although I'd really like to. A short man, as fit as a boxer in his prime, with a head of salt and pepper hair, my father exuded a quiet confidence and a steely resolve that endeared him to his employees and struck fear in the hearts of his competitors. Tonight he wore creased black slacks, Italian loafers, no socks, a starched white shirt, and a smile for me. How anyone could be uncrumpled at this ungodly hour was an enduring mystery. It wasn't hereditary, that was for sure. If you've come down here about the girl in the Ferrari showroom, I glanced around, making sure no one was paying particular attention to our conversation, but everyone seemed to be focused on his or her own tasks. He pursed his lips, then shook his head. I figure you've got it under control. Turn it over to the police and then manage their interference. You've done it a thousand times. Well, not quite that many, thankfully but I wasn't going to argue. Through the years, the big boss had seen stuff I didn't even want to think about. Death has become mundane, has it? I said, trying to make light, but with my heavy heart, I don't think I pulled it off. As long as it's not imminent, my father shot back. He had a point, I guess. Not one I could identify with, but I'd learned long ago the big boss was who he was. For a long time, I'd wondered whether he knew where any bodies were buried. Vegas being what it is, he'd done business with the mob back in the day, and the whispers still followed him. He'd never cultivated that reputation, but he didn't work to dispel the rumors either. So he remained surrounded by mystery, something I think he got a big bang out of. Personally, I couldn't see my father throwing his lot in with Tony Spilatro, Lefty Rosenthal, and the boys, but, as recent history had proven once again, I was not the best judge of character, especially when it came to men. However, family was family, blood thicker than water and all that. I looped an arm around his shoulders, gave him a quick squeeze, then stepped back. In heels, I had him by at least six inches, a fact that always surprised me. He just seemed bigger. Poker. A game that totally eludes me. He nodded toward the two pros, now engrossed in the game the young Mr. Weston had just joined. Give me some dice to throw and I'm all in. Nothing like the rush of a pure, unadulterated gamble? He gave me a knowing look, the sort a father shares with a child. 
No words were necessary. For some reason, the exchange gave me a warm fuzzy. We'd had those moments before, when I hadn't known of our blood relation, but somehow the father-daughter thing changed things in a subtle, insidious, heartwarming way. Working my head from side to side in an attempt to move muscles that felt like tight steel bands, I rolled my eyes at myself. What was it with me lately? Soft and mushy were not adjectives anyone would use to describe me. Of that I felt certain. I must be hormonal. Meaningful sex would be a good cure for that. But, given my lack of a meaningful relationship, that was a pipe dream. However, even a dog with a bad nose eventually found a bone, right? Easily amused, I smiled at the puns. What? my father asked. What? My face fell into a mask of guilty innocence. What were you smiling at? Once again, ignoring the impropriety of touching my boss, it sent all the wrong messages to those who cared enough to notice. I hooked my arm through my father's. That you will never know. There are simply some things a father should never know about his daughter. Probably so. I shock easily, he teased. So, how was the party? I asked, in a deft change of topic. Each year before the smackdown begins, the big boss hosted a party for all the big guns in the poker world. Most of them had been longtime friends, so the party usually wound up late and involved a king's ransom in single malt and habanos. Exhausting. Back in the day, I could hold my own, but not anymore. Now they leave me in the dust, even the old farts. I can't tell you how good that makes me feel. He shot me a grin, which took the wine out of his statement. Was Frank DeLuca there? Sure, but he left early. How early? My father gave me a shrewd look. A little before midnight? Why? You know why. We've got a dead girl in his dealership. Inquiring minds are going to want to know his whereabouts between 2 and 2.30 this morning. Frank's been around. I didn't know exactly what he meant by that. I wanted to pursue it, but there was a time and a place, and his clipped tone told me this was clearly neither. Anyone else interesting there? The usual suspects. The knife edge slid from my father's voice. Funny thing, though. This year Shady Slim was a no-show. That's not like him. No, it's not. And he hasn't checked in yet. I looked into it myself. A shadow of worry passed across my father's face. His health hasn't been good. But still, normally he would let me know if you couldn't make it. I'll follow up tomorrow. I gave his arm a squeeze, just because I felt like it. Tonight you may be feeling your years, but I bet you were the only expectant father in the room. Like a kid caught out after curfew, he blanched and shot me a worried look. Shoot, I forgot. Forgot what? Your mother, he said, weariness creeping into his voice. How could anyone forget Mona? She'd never allow it. Another thought wiped the grin off my face. She's okay, isn't she? My mother, the former owner of Mona's Place, the self-styled best whorehouse in Nevada, had recently had a life-changing experience. My parents, afraid of offending those holding the keys to the kingdom, Marrying an underage hooker would have catapulted my father right off the fast track and probably have landed him in jail, had carried a torch for each other for half a lifetime. After a recent health scare, and with the realization that they no longer had anything to lose other than perhaps their last chance at happiness, my parents had married. And now, after years in the sex trade, Mona found herself inexplicably with child at an age where normal mothers are looking forward to bouncing grandchildren on their knees. Of course, normal was never an adjective used to describe mother. Call me shallow, but I took a perverted delight in the cosmic justice, the laughable irony of it all. Except when I had to deal with her. A one-woman weapon of mass destruction, a pregnant Mona should come with a biohazard warning label. I took a good hard look at my father, he seemed to be holding up well. Of course, he was made of sterner stuff than his daughter. How exactly would you define okay? 
my father asked with a tired grin. She's alive and well, propped up in bed, miserable, unable to sleep. So that means neither of us get any shut-eye. Now she wants ice cream and something covered with mustard. I've been wandering around for half an hour trying to figure out what that might be. Every Achilles has his heel, and Mona was my father's. Is it really going to matter? She won't be hungry when you get back. So get her a bowl of raspberry gelato, her favorite, and a big coney dog with mustard. My stomach roiled at the thought. And perhaps a double hit of single malt for you. You wouldn't like to... My father shot me his hangdog look. I fought the urge to cave and give him what he wanted. If only there was a vaccine against handsome men. Do I look suicidal? Well, there's a rumor floating around that you took down the mighty stone man, so I had high hopes that, fortified with the thrill of victory, you might be willing to wade back into the fray. Please, Marvin is a piker compared to Mother. She would be less than pleased at the comparison. I'd love to walk with you, but I still have some tidying up to do. I caught Rachel's eye and motioned for her to come over. My father gave my hand a quick squeeze, then left to continue his mission. I didn't envy him. A thankless, dangerous job trying to mollify a pregnant woman. Rachel, I said, turning my attention to the young woman as she rushed to my side. Do you remember a blonde in a silver dress playing in the thousand-dollar buy-in? The one who was cheating? Rachel said it so matter-of-factly, I almost blew right by. You knew? Of course. The game had been in progress an hour when my shift started. I was to take over for Mr. Johnstone. The girl stared over my shoulder, her eyes unfocused, as if she was reviewing an internal tape. I wanted to remove her from the table. That's standard procedure, she said unnecessarily. But I was overruled. Is that what you and Mr. Johnstone argued about? He wanted to fire me. He said I was being insubordinate. Rachel's eyes welled up. Miss O'Toole, I was just trying to do my job. I know you were. I gave her a pat. And now she's turned up dead and all. A tear leaked out, despite her best efforts to fight it back. I feel terrible. Dead? I asked, feigning innocence. That's what I heard. From whom? Mr. Johnstone. When? I don't know. The lady in the silver dress had just left, and her game was winding up. It was after that that Mr. Johnstone asked for twenty minutes of personal time. I had to get the high-stakes games underway myself. I see, I said, which was a bald-faced lie. Was it normal for Mr. Johnstone to leave like that? No, but we all have emergencies. Rachel wiped her hands down her pants as she regained her composure a bit. We all cover for each other. You're sure Mr. Johnstone didn't notice the lady in question was cheating? Apparently not, and he refused to question the woman about it. Rachel worried with the end of a strand of hair, twisting it around her finger. I would have been fired if you hadn't fired Mr. Johnstone first. Her weak smile torpedoed mine, and my mood sank with it. I had a real bad feeling about this. Did you call security? Mr. Johnstone was livid, but yes, I called them. Rachel nodded. He was here in a jiffy. He? It had been my experience that security usually came in twos. Yeah, it was sort of weird, but since I'd seen the guy around, I didn't think too much of it at the time. Much of what? Well... The girl again tugged at a strand of blonde hair. I resisted the urge to take her hand and make her stop. Like I said, after I called, this guy shows up real fast. Can you describe him? If she couldn't, I'd bet all my worldly possessions that I could. Yes, a tall, handsome man. Green eyes, brown hair, jeans. The guy with the whole cowboy thing going on. Give me a minute. I remember his name. A slightly goofy, dreamy look flashed across her features. I'd seen that look on a woman's face before, and I knew who put it there. Dane, I offered, 
knowing the answer. That's it. How'd you know? Lucky guess. Sometimes it sucked to be right. My voice took on a murderous tone. You said all this was weird. What exactly did you mean? I don't need to tell you, Miss O'Toole, that security usually comes in pairs, so it was odd he showed up alone. Then, when a security team showed up a bit later, I knew something wasn't cricket. You turned them away? I told them what happened, but they didn't seem alarmed, so I let it go. The girl worried with the medallion she wore around her neck, sliding it first one way, then the other, on the long gold chain. Looking back, maybe I should have done something else. I don't know what. I resisted reaching out and grabbing her hand to stop the worried motion. The girl was as twitchy as a dog with fleas. So, Dane shows up. What happened then? I asked, even though I knew the answer. Mr. Dane and the woman left together. He said he could handle it from there. Dane had handled it all right, and now he was trying to handle me. Not a good idea if longevity was part of his future plans. Running on high-octane adrenaline, I covered ground through the casino in long, angry strides. I hated to be played. I hated to be lied to. Guess that made me pretty normal. Normal. What a mediocre word. And not something I especially aspired to, which somehow made me even angrier. But Dane could wait. Right now, I needed to track down Frank DeLuca before the cops rode up on my tail. Grabbing my phone from its hip cradle, I pushed talk. Jerry, you got a bead on Frank DeLuca? Give me a sec. I caught a glimpse of him on one of the feeds not too long ago. Jerry sounded tired. Not that I was surprised. We were both rowing the same boat. You think he's still around? Poker dudes are nocturnal creatures. Besides, as one of the last nine players in this weekend's shindig, he's basking in the attention. With everything else, I'd forgotten about that. Jerry whistled under his breath as I waited. I could picture him scrolling through the feeds. Yep, there he is. Garden bar, top tier. From the looks of him, he's been there a while. Thanks. I reholstered my phone and ran. At this time of morning, the crowd in the casino consisted of either those too drunk to find their rooms or those winning or losing big. Music thumped in the background. Glasses clinked in the bar, not from frivolity, but from the bartender washing, drying, and putting away. Vegas might be the city that never sleeps, but the energy level did have its own circadian rhythm. Right now, it faded to a low ebb, allowing for regenerating, recharging, and for me to actually make it across the hotel and out the back in near record time. The garden bar hung in the branches of a huge tree overlooking the pool area. Reminiscent of the Swiss Family Robinson treehouse, but on steroids, the bar consisted of several levels, each with a counter in the middle, surrounded by bar stools. A rope and a mesh fence that was stronger than it looked ringed the perimeter and protected patrons from a plunge to shore disability. At appropriate intervals, two tops cozied up to the rope enclosure. The real trick here was not finding the place, but getting to it. A wobbly plank and rope footbridge connected the structure to the mezzanine level of the hotel. Late at night when I was feeling particularly sadistic, I loved to park myself next to the bridge and watch the patrons who had sampled too much of the local fire water negotiate a bridge that moved. Tonight, my mood ran more to homicidal, so I didn't stop. DeLuca hadn't moved. Slumped down in his chair, he reminded me of a rag doll, slack and forlorn. One hand fisted around a glass, firmly anchored him to a two-top next to the railing. By all accounts, he was a handsome man, thick and broad, oozing virility and a hint of impishness when he smiled. Women flocked to him, eager to run their fingers through his thick black hair or to discover the joke that lit his eyes. And through some divine lack of spine, He'd never been able to resist a pretty face, tight body, large rack, curvaceous booty, or any combination thereof, 
At least, not that I'd ever been able to tell. Married several times, Frank was an eternal optimist and self-delusional to the end. He seemed genuinely surprised each time a wife would take umbrage with his dalliances. Guileless, a child in a man's body, Frank was the kind of guy a woman hated to love, but one they couldn't resist. Thankfully, since I'd called him Uncle Frank for as long as I could remember, I'd been inoculated. Besides, he was my father's age. But, as I recall, wife number four had been two years behind me in school. She'd worked flat on her back under Frank for a few years, until she was certain the courts would give her a solid stake. I'd heard she'd bought a high-end jewelry store at one of our competitors, but I wasn't sure. As far as I knew, Frank hadn't married again. Frank looked up when I eased into the chair across from him. He flashed me a pale imitation of his famous smile. You okay? I asked, reaching across the table and squeezing his arm. Sort of shook, you know. Red rimmed, his eyes were wet. His hand shook as he wiped away any trace of a tear. I didn't have anything to do with that girl. His expression reminded me of a kid trying to convince the authorities he hadn't blown up the chemistry lab despite the M80 in his back pocket. My father tells me you left his party early. That's not the last to leave Frank I know and love. I got a call from Slim's plane. He wanted me to meet him at the airport. Why? He was all riled over the political wrangling around legalizing internet poker and bringing it back on shore. Frank turned his glass in his hand, then took a long pull. You know they got that legislation before Congress. Everybody's picking sides. A huge pile of money is at stake. We've all been trying to figure that one out. But why'd Slim want to talk at midnight when both of you were supposed to be at the big boss's party? He'd gotten wind someone was fighting dirty, trying to kill the legislation. Why'd he care? You know how he is, guarding the sacred game of poker. The cheaters ought to be shot at dawn, I said, smiling at the memories. How many times had I heard Slim say that as he pounded the table? Do you know where he is now? I left him on the plane. He said he was hitting the hay, as he put it. Frank motioned to the cocktail waitress hovering nearby. I'll take another. Lucky, you want anything? Needing breakfast, I nodded. Wild Turkey 101, make it a double. I waited until we both had our libations in hand before continuing. So you met him at, what, about midnight? A bit later, maybe half after. We talked for about an hour, I guess. Where'd you leave it? I took a sip of whiskey, looking for courage. And where'd you go after? Lucky girl, you're getting awful personal. I didn't say anything. Instead, my eyes sought his. Holding them, I didn't blink. Finally, he broke our gaze. I hadn't talked any sense into him. I had the feeling he was going to be proactive, if you get my drift, with or without my help. Did he name any names? Frank shook his head. After that, I went home, alone. You didn't come back to the hotel? I didn't have anything to do with that girl, if that's what you're driving at. She came on to me, you know. We met playing poker. She beat the pants off me. He tossed me a weak grin. Never had a girl do that to me before. I bet. At poker. He gave me a semi-suggestive look. With Frank, flirting was his default language. Boy, she was a pretty thing. He shook his head as he stared into his drink. Whatever he was looking for, I doubted he'd find it there. And? I took a sip of my liquid sustenance. For some reason, I wasn't ashamed. If beer could be a breakfast food, well, this was just the natural progression. Nothing. Frank said with forced casualness. Any idea how she came to know your code word to the security system at the dealership? Shock registered in his eyes, turning them from a light blue to a distant gray. The cops didn't tell me that part. You talked to the cops already? This time the surprise was mine. 
They called me about the murder. He shivered. I raced right down to the dealership, but nobody mentioned the code thing. My heart rate slowed. Dodged that bullet. Romeo's was the last shit list I wanted to find my name on. They didn't know. Frank pushed himself up in his chair. I appreciate you not telling them, Lucky. That'd make it real bad for me. You understand I'm going to have to tell them eventually. He shrugged, his reluctance poorly hidden. Come clean, Frank. The sooner we catch the killer, the better for all of us. Even the whiff of murder threw the media into a feeding frenzy. My entire staff and all their considerable talents might not be enough to keep us from being sucked into the maw of public opinion and digested whole. Nothing to tell, really. Me and Sylvie, we got drunk together a few times. Had some laughs. Where? The dealership once or twice, but home mostly. And do you have your code word written down anywhere? Or is it on a computer or something? Frank was old school. I doubted he knew how to turn on a computer, much less use one, but I had to ask. I keep all my personal stuff and a notebook in my desk drawer at home. His brows furrowed, but he didn't look too worried. The drawer's locked. Personal stuff? Bank accounts, brokerage accounts, the odd investment or two, the security code word, passwords, stuff like that. Frank shrugged, as if he couldn't imagine anyone stupid enough to tamper with his stuff. Personally, I couldn't imagine someone that brazen either. Frank might play the clown, but when it came to business, he was anything but. And he had important friends. And your money? All accounted for. I checked a little while ago. I got this app on my iPhone. He pulled the device out of his pocket and pushed it across the table toward me. Along with it came a baggie containing a few recognizable blue pills, which he hurriedly grabbed and stuffed back in his pocket. I raised an eyebrow and gave him what I hoped to be a disapproving look. Don't want to go falling down on the job. I'd sure hate to disappoint the ladies with a lackluster performance. He had the decency to blush as he grabbed his phone and pushed it into his pocket also. Up to you, I said, as I revised my opinion about Frank and computers. And because not only was I fluent in sarcasm, I dabbled in innuendo as well. You said you entertained her in the dealership. Could she have overheard you using the code word then? The corners of his mouth turned down. I suppose. I'm not that careful, especially after throwing back a couple. Besides, being in the company of a beautiful woman, code words and silly shit like that weren't exactly uppermost in my mind. I resisted crawling up on my soapbox. Casual sex gives me hives, and disdain for security punches my buttons. Any idea why she would take the code? Haven't a clue. All we got in there is cars, and the keys are locked tight in a safe every night. We don't carry much cash. Anything missing? No, he sighed. And now I'm gonna have one hell of a time unloading that car. I thought I had it sold to that amateur, but now... Amateur? Yeah, that slurry kid. He test drove it yesterday and was all hot to go. He had the jack, too. If he doesn't want it, feng shui it and sell it overseas, I said, half joking. You can do that? Who knows? I waved his next question away, interjecting one of my own. You don't know what Sylvie was doing in your dealership. What she wanted? Haven't a clue. Well, whatever it is, someone was willing to kill for it.